Hello folks, my name is Tim and welcome back to my channel. So before I begin today's video, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who's liked my videos or taken the time to leave comments and feedback because I really appreciate that. This is a very young channel, so in particular, I'm grateful to everyone who subscribed. That really helps me. Thank you all very much for taking the time to do that. It really is appreciated. And in fact, today's video is actually something of a request because I had a few comments on my previous video around the ESP01 module asking for a video on the NRF24L01. That's uh, this little module here. So today we're going to take a look at this thing and learn how to use it. So on my desk here, I have two Raspberry Pi Picos connected identically to two small buttons and two NRF24L01 wireless modules. Now, if I hold down the button on this first Pico here, you can see the LED on both of these Picos turns on. And when I release the button, they both turn off. Now, if I do the same on the other Pico over here, well, the same thing happens. And that's because these two Picos are communicating wirelessly using these NRF24L01 modules. We have a two-directional wireless communication mechanism. So, Let's take a look at how this module works and how the demo was put together. The NRF24L01 is an easily obtainable wireless transmitter and receiver module that operates in the frequency of 2.4 GHz. The datasheet for it is readily available online and the module claims a maximum range of around 100 meters, although this will depend on the quality and configuration of the modules you're using. In my demo here, I'm using these little modules which feature built-in antennas, making them quite small and compact, but you can get modules like this one which have an external aerial connector which should give them a longer range. So, there's some degree of variety to these things, and obviously pick whichever one is most appropriate for your application. Since the NRF24L01 is connected over the Serial Peripheral Interface, or SPI, the first thing we need to understand in order to use one is how SPI works. However, for those of you who already have a good understanding of SPI, I've added some timestamps in the description of this video, so you can just skip this part if you'd like to. Okay, so SPI was created by Motorola back in the 1980s, and much like the I2C interface that we previously looked at, SPI is a pretty ubiquitous mechanism for interfacing with microcontrollers. It's a full duplex synchronous serial communication interface, and that means, as with any serial interface, SPI writes one data bit out at a time over a single communication line. However, it's also a full duplex interface that can both send and receive concurrently. So it actually uses two communication lines, one for sending and one for receiving. Since it's a synchronous interface, it also requires a clock signal to synchronize communications between controllers and peripherals. SPI can communicate between multiple peripherals, but unlike I2C, it doesn't use addresses. Instead, it requires a GPIO pin to be connected to each individual peripheral, and this pin is used to select the desired communication target. So, as a minimum, we need four connections to make SPI work, and we need an additional connection for each subsequent peripheral that we'd like to add. This, of course, means the number of available GPIO pins on our controller is a limiting factor when using SPI. However, it can run much faster than I2C, making it an attractive choice for some applications. So let's talk about terminology. Since SPI is an old standard, it uses the terms master and slave to identify the communicating devices and label the pins used. Obviously, that's not something we find acceptable today, and there have been several efforts to remove that sort of language from technical specifications. For SPI in particular, the Open Source Hardware Association have proposed an alternative naming convention that replaces the term master with controller and slave with peripheral, and I'll be using those names throughout the rest of this video. First though, let's take a look at how the pins are labelled using both the old and newly proposed names. So using the old naming scheme, we have the clock signal labelled SCLK for serial clock. Next we have the MOSI and MISO pins 
Mozzie stands for Master Out, Slave In, and MISO stands for Master In, Slave Out. And these are the SPI data lines. Finally, we have the Slave Select pin labeled SS, and that's used to select the device we want to talk to. In the newly proposed naming scheme, these labels change to the following. Mozzie becomes Copy for Controller Out, Peripheral In, MISO becomes KIPPO for Controller In, Peripheral Out, and SS becomes CS for Chip Select. So, with our terminology established, there's one more thing we need to talk about before we can start using the interface. SPI is what's called a de facto standard, and that means it became a standard due to wide-scale adoption by vendors, rather than through any formal agreement. And this has led to a number of variations on the theme of SPI. Briefly, these tend to be around the clock pulse polarity, that is whether the clock is considered active high or active low, and around the clock phase or timing. And this is whether data is transmitted on the leading edge of the clock pulse or on its trailing edge. Of course, the combination of these differences gives rise to a number of permutations, so it's often necessary to check this with your peripherals datasheet before you can start using it. Luckily, software libraries exist for many common peripherals that take care of all these details, and this is indeed the case for the NRF24L01. So now that we understand the basics of SPI, let's look at how to wire up the NRF24L01 module specifically. As this is a 3.3 volt module, we'll be powering it from the Raspberry Pi Pico's onboard 3.3 volt regulator, broken out at physical pin 36. Next, we need a ground connection, and I'm using physical pin 38 for this, simply because it's conveniently close to the 3.3 volt supply pin. Next, we connect the CSN, or chip select not pin, to GPIO pin 15, and this is the SPI chip select pin. For the NRF24L01, chip select is active low. So when that pin is driven low, the module becomes the active peripheral for SPI communication. Next to the CSN pin, we have a pin labeled CE for chip enable. And this is used to control the transmitter in the NRF24L01. When this pin is set high, the transmitter is enabled and messages can be sent and received. When the chip enable is set low, the module enters a lower power standby mode. Next, we have the copy pin or mozzie pin in the old naming scheme. And that's connected to GPIO pin 7 on the Pico labeled SPI0TX or transmit. After this, we have our clock signal, and this is connected to the SPI0 clock pin on the Pico at GPIO pin number 6. The next pin, labelled IRQ, is provided to let the peripheral raise an interrupt on the controller so it can respond to important events. But we don't need to use this today, so we're not going to connect it. Finally, we come to our KIPPO pin, or MISO pin in the old scheme. And this is connected to the Pico's SPI0RX, or receive pin, and that's broken out at GPIO pin number 4. OK, so that's all there is to connecting up this module. Purely for the purposes of our demo, the little push button is connected between GPIO pin number 28 and the 33 volt supply. OK, with the hardware side of things covered, now let's take a look at the software. Conveniently, there exists a MicroPython driver for the NRF24L01, and you can find it in the MicroPython Git repository on GitHub under the Drivers folder, and I'll leave a link in the description. Now, this driver is going to make working with the NRF24L01 much easier, as it takes care of all the SPI interface specifics. We just need to tell it what to send and when. However, if you're interested in what's going on under the hood, then this code is actually very easy to follow and it's well worth reading over. In order for our demo software to import this driver module, we need to place it into the Pico storage. To do that, you just need to load it up in Thonny, go to Save As, select the Pico from the pop-up, and then save the file using the name nrf24l01.py. And this only needs to be done once, unless you need to modify the driver for some reason. Right, so now let's take a look at our demo software.
So as usual, we begin by importing the necessary modules that we're going to need. We're obviously going to need the PIN module to define some GPIO pins, the SPI module because we're using an SPI-based peripheral, and the struct module because we're going to pack some binary data. After that, we then go ahead and import the NRF24L01 driver module that we previously prepared. With our imports completed, we define a block of pins. So the first pin is used to control the onboard LED. The second pin is used to read back the push button status. And then we have the CSN and CE pins. And these pins are needed to tell the NRF24L01 driver which pin we have connected to the chip select not input and which pin we have connected to the CE or chip enable input. Right, so with our pins defined, we then need to go ahead and define two pipeline addresses. Now, these are needed because each NRF24L01 module can communicate with up to six other peers, and this is achieved by using the concept of pipelines. Each pipe has a unique address and can be used to either send or receive messages. If each peer listens on its own specific pipe, then it will only ever get the messages that were intended for it. Since in our demo here, we're doing two-way communication, we need to define two pipeline addresses, one for messages destined for the first Pico and one for messages destined for the second. And in fact, the only difference in the software running on the first Pico versus that running on the second Pico is the order of these pipeline addresses. Because obviously on one of those Picos, we need to flip these addresses so the receiving pipe becomes the transmit pipe and the transmit pipe becomes the receiving pipe. So with our initialization completed, we encounter the first of our functions, and that's this little setup function here. Now this function is just going to create an instance of the NRF24L01 driver. To do that, we need to provide the SPI interface we'd like to use. Now the Raspberry Pi Pico actually has two interfaces, so here we're providing the first one because that's the one we've wired up. We also need to provide the CSN pin object and the CE pin object. Finally, we also need to provide a payload size, and that's because the NRF24L01 transmits fixed-sized packets. Now, for our demo, we're just sending over a 32-bit integer value, and that's, of course, 4 bytes in size, so we say we'd like a payload size of 4 bytes, please. So, with the driver object constructed, we can then go ahead and open our transmission pipe and our receiving pipe and then we just start listening. And at this point, the NRF24L01 is actually ready to start receiving messages. Finally, before we return from our setup function, we make sure that our LED is initially turned off. Right, so that's all there is to the setup function. After that, we just have our little demo function here, and this is the main body of this program. So all we're doing here is initializing a state value to zero, and then entering the main loop. So within this loop, we have two sections. The first section here is concerned with checking the local state of our button. So we compare the button state to the previously stored state, and if they don't match, then we know the button has either been pressed or released. So we'll record that state and set the value of the LED accordingly. But of course, we also need to transmit this information over to our counterpart Pico. So that's what this little bit of code does here. Initially, we need to stop listening because now we're going to transmit. We then attempt to transmit by using nrf.send and then struct.pack and finally the state. So we pack the state into a little binary object and we use nrf.send to transmit it. Now, this is wrapped inside of a try block because the NRF24L01 actually expects to use a reliable communication mechanism. Now, reliable in this context doesn't mean that your messages are always guaranteed to arrive. This is a wireless communication after all, and messages can get lost. But what it means is that when a message is received by the recipient, that message should be acknowledged. So a little response message should come back to say, yep, I got your message, everything is fine. 
Now, if the driver doesn't get that response message back in time, it raises an OS error exception to suggest that the message may not have arrived. And that gives us an opportunity to do something sensible, like maybe retransmit the message if we care enough. However, when I first set up this demo, I was always getting this error message, no matter what I did, and I could see that the message was received successfully, but the driver didn't seem to think so. Now, I got around that problem by enabling something called auto-acknowledgement, but we'll take a look at that in just a moment. Anyway, once we've finished with our transmission, we need to return to the listening state in case the other Pico has a message that it wants to send to us. And that's what this second part of the loop actually takes care of. So here we're saying if nrf.any, and this means if we have any data to read, then go ahead and read it. So we use nrf.receive to read back the message. We use struct.unpack to return the integer that we previously packed. And then we just set the LED status to whatever that message contained. And that's how we're able to switch the LED on on both Picos when we press the button on either of them. Right, so let's talk about the auto acknowledgement feature that I mentioned a moment ago. While reading through the data sheet, I came across something called Enhanced Shock Burst, and this seems to be a proprietary name for a selection of useful features and functions that are built into the hardware for dealing with things like automatically acknowledging transmitted messages and automatically resending failed transmissions. However, these features are not enabled by default in the NRF24L01 driver, that I downloaded from MicroPython, which suggests that perhaps this enhanced shock burst stuff isn't built into every NRF24L01 module. It is available on the modules that I'm using, so I've just turned on the auto acknowledgement feature because it's very convenient. So to do that, I've created this little function here. So what this does is to write into one of the registers of the NRF24L01, and of course that's done over the SPI interface. Now, the driver actually provides this little reg write function to take care of the specifics of doing that. So we just need to provide the address of the register we'd like to write to and a value that we'd like to place into it. So that's what I've done here. So this address here, 01, is the register address of the auto acknowledgement feature. And this value here is actually a series of flags. So the first five bits are used to enable auto acknowledgement on the different pipelines that the NRF24L01 might have. And the final three bits here are currently reserved and must be set to zero. So this little function here basically turns on auto acknowledgement for all available pipelines pretty handy. In fact, I think I'll probably end up writing a little patch for the MicroPython driver to expose these features in case they're useful for anyone else. Anyway, so that's the source code for our program. To run it, we just call the setup function to build our little driver object. Then we enable our auto acknowledgement mechanism. And finally, we call the demo function, which is of course the main loop of the program. And at that point, both Picos are now listening for messages and monitoring their buttons. When a button press comes along, they stop listening and they transmit, nice and simple. So there we go. That's how to use the NRF24L01 module with the Raspberry Pi Pico and MicroPython. Now, as always, I'll upload all of this code to GitHub, so feel free to go grab it and check it out. And of course, if you want the NRF24L01 driver, you'll have to go and get that from the MicroPython repository. Link in the description. Thank you for watching, and I hope this has been useful.